Good morning. It's Friday. Um, somebody made a joke on Facebook a couple of days ago about that old Rebecca Black song, Friday. You remember that one? Um, and they said that she was smarter than we realized she was because we needed somebody to count to tell us which day it was. But uh, this morning, ever since I've got up, I've been... I've had Rebecca Black's Friday stuck in my head, which is probably not the kind of thing that you want to have to say. I don't know. It's, if you haven't seen, you know what I'm talking about, just YouTube it. It's this song from like 10 years ago that this like middle school or her parents paid to have written and recorded for. It's cheesy. It's corny. It's everything you might need today. Uh, <laughs> good morning, Amy. Hey, Debbie. Hey, Michelle. Uh, hey, other Debbie. We got a couple of Debbies on already. Hey, Pep. Uh, hey, Miss Donna, how are you doing? Hey, Jay. Uh, so we're trying to experiment this morning just because just I'm curious um, with what this could do. But do me a favor. If, if you want to, would you consider sharing this video now? Because uh, I'm just i curious. So just curious. But if you're willing to kind of expend a little bit of a social equity for me, um, just do me a favor and share this. I'm just kind of, like I said, I'm just curious. A little experiment this morning. But uh, we're excited to be here today. Um, last passage in first Peter, finishing up this book, wrapping up the time that we've spent together, uh, over the last four or five weeks, maybe I can't remember how long it's been, uh, <laughs> but just going through first Peter, um, and we're going to, our next book is going to be Jonah. I'm really excited about that. I love Jonah. Uh, Jonah, uh, a lot of times I feel like we think of Jonah as like a vacation Bible school book. But we don't really read it as adults, and I think that Jonah would actually piggyback on to some of the things that we've been talking about in First Peter really, really well. So excited to have that done. Hey, Michelle. Yeah, I was just, I was tanked. I was, I, I had been on the phone or on Zoom for like nine hours yesterday. Uh, hey, Rocky, how are you doing, man? Um, uh, so we're just gonna jump into this. Now, the way we kind of always, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I put my. Uh, I'm going to make sure I put my, my comment here that we need to make about stuff. But if you've not dropped your prayer request in to the bar yet, just to invite you to go ahead and do that. We uh, uh, do scripture and then we do prayer. Same thing pretty much every morning. Uh, and if you have a prayer request, I invite you to leave that in the comment bar. And uh, we the time comes later on in our time together this morning that we can uh, come to that and do that. So let me make a real quick comment. We'll get off through, off and go. Good morning, Mr. Preston. So good to see you. All right, we got that up, ready to roll. Okay, uh, so I'm going to read. I'm reading New Living, New Living Translation this morning, um, and for the main reason. Uh, because I've, I've talked about translation stuff enough to where I'll tell you what I'm reading in the morning and why I'm doing it. I'm reading New Living Translation because, honestly, the English standard this morning for this passage was just way too complicated. It's kind of just janky. But we just really read the uh, last two verses, or last three verses of First Peter. First Peter 5, 12 through uh, 14. I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, as does my son Mark. Greet each other with Christian love. Peace be with all of you who are in Christ. And I said yesterday that there's just kind of a couple of fun things to talk about with this passage today. And that's kind of what I, I continue to echo um, morning, Catherine. How are you doing? Hey, Dennis. So good to see you. Uh, that the fun stuff that we find going on, it, it's just kind of, it's, it's fun stuff. I don't think there's anything really that's just, like we've read a lot of just, I feel like personally groundbreaking things in First Peter over the last few weeks. Um, but the ending of it is just kind of fun because think about this. How do you end things? Um, you know, there's there's a kind of a phrase that people throw around a lot now. Finish strong, like make sure you you if you end with the same level of fervor you had the whole thing. Like, how do you end things? Or think about like, how do you get off the phone? Or if you're ending an email, like how do you what do you use to wrap things up? Because that's really what we do in the ending. So many times, like okay, let's just wrap this up. Let's try to find a way that this can be communicated succinctly. Maybe there's a couple of points we want to make sure that people uh, understood and saw and did not leave out, that sort of a thing. Um, 
and so Peter's ending things right now. And so it makes us think about, you know, what's the most important thing? Like what maybe is the last word that Peter had? And I feel like he, he has one in a way that continues the thread. But before he does that, there's just a couple of, like I said, the first neat thing, it says this. It says, I've written this short letter to you with the help of Silas. Now, Silas is actually a guy that we see pop up at other places in the New Testament. We read about him in the book of Acts, that he accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. We also know that, that Silas was attached to the writing of both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, along with Timothy, one of Paul's assistants. Um, uh, we see um, Silas show up in a couple of other just letters, and uh, he, in 2nd Corinthians it talks about Silas. Um, so church tradition also holds Silas to be part of the 70. And so what I think is so neat about this is we see the interconnectedness between these early apostles and the things that they are doing. More than Larry, more than Jason. Um, that there are there are people there are not as many people involved in this thing as we might think it to be. And that's not to be a discouragement, but what you see is this this group of people that were extremely and hyper-involved for the first few decades of the church that seemed to be just everywhere, that just kind of constantly moving. Um, if we look back in the stories of Jesus inside the Gospels, uh, we see a pattern um, that's been placed before. We might have talked about it on this, but um, I call it one three twelve seventy. that we really see that Jesus spent the predominant amount of his time and energy focusing on three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And then the three disciples were part of a larger group called the Twelve. And then at one point in time in the ministry of Jesus, he gave his power to them and sent them out to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and to exercise and control the demonic realm. Uh, and they came back and made this report. And then Jesus did the same thing and sent out another group of 70 followers of his with the same mission. And what we find is a lot of these people like Silas that show up in a couple of uh, different ways across the, the stories of the early church are, are considered by tradition to be part of the 70, that they are part of these people who spent their time with Jesus um, and were not as, as close, but you see the, the, the drastic effect that the average size church in the United States is, is actually underneath 100 people. Like the 70 people, like the average size of a church having this global impact. And so it makes you really think about just what can happen with you, what kind of a difference a handful of people can make. And I also think it's interesting because when we, we've talked about it a little bit during this, but there is this continual beef almost. That I think a lot of us were taught between Peter and Paul. And if you, and if you read Paul's writings, you begin to see this kind of beef worked out. But a lot of the things that Peter's talking about here in this passage seem to appeal to, to kind of Paul's point of view or the ministry that he ended up having. And now we find Peter is actually working alongside of one of Paul's closest friends and closest kind of cooperators or maybe conspirators in ministry. Uh, and so it, this just makes me think that some of the stuff that you know we might have been talking is kind of like Christian pop culture about Paul and Peter might not necessarily be true in the latter half of their life, which which is hopeful. I think that's a really fun idea. But we see uh, we see Silas mentioned here. And then we also see Mark. He says, as does my son Mark. And Mark was not Peter's son, but it's most likely his nephew. Um, and that Mark uh, played the role of Peter's scribe. And so the gospel of Mark, in many ways, people would say that that is the gospel of Peter, that that was um, Mark just kind of putting down these stories that he has from uh, Peter, um, and you just see uh, Mark also um, his 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 family's home factors in a couple of places uh, that his that that was where Peter fled to in Jerusalem after uh, he uh, didn't escape from jail, but after the walls came down and, and um, that Peter managed to get out, and so you see John Mark as this young person that grew up around this Christian movement. And so just the thing with the interconnectedness of a handful of people have the ability to make this just extreme uh, difference in the life of our world. And so you might think that who you're gathered with normally doesn't have the ability to make an impact. But what we find in scripture is that a few dozen people changed the world. And that there was, they, they, they were filled with the same power of God that's available to us now. And so just, just to just to take that and think about it. And the second thing that's going on, this is where I think Peter is 
kind of trying to succinctly put together this whole book that he has is with with two sections. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, is that that he, he begins speaking about experiences and the suffering. He says, uh, "My purpose in writing this is encourage you and assure that you, you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace." New Revised Standard says, "Hold fast in this grace," which I just think sounds cooler. Um, <laughs> but you know, what do we have going on here? Because if we read this quickly and without reading the rest of the book. It might sound like Peter saying that these bad things that are happening to them are the will of God. And this is where I just, this is where reading things slowly and reading entire books to understand this kind of the narrative line. Good morning, Miss Cheryl. How are you doing? Hey, Bell. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, Patty. Hey, Byron. We've had a lot of folks pop on. That's awesome. Uh, experiment is working. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, but we've read this whole thing, and we've seen that, 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 that Peter lines out sufferings in a couple different ways. And then the second thing is something we talked about a few days ago, but are these, these things called means of grace. And that the means of grace are ordinary things that God works through to show us the truth of who he is and to encourage us in this aspect. And so it, Peter seems like he's using means of grace language here. Because um, that's what he says, my purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you. So he tells us right there why he wrote the book. To encourage and assure that the things that you are experiencing are part of God's graciousness. And it's not God's will. It's not God's, it's, it's not God's intentionality or God's direction. It's part of God's grace. And so the way that we move through bad things in our life tells a story about the level we are willing to assign the work of God and the activity of God in our lives and in our hearts. Can God work through these things we're doing? Um, or does God not work through these things we're doing? So it, it makes us begin to think. And also we realize that we've seen two types of suffering in First Peter. Um, the first type of suffering are these things that are done to us, that are these physical sufferings, these physical things that we have to deal with. Um, and we've talked, I mean, there's, there's some conversation about persecution, those sorts of things in First Peter. We're going to come back to that in a second. But what we also see is for us understand, and I, I wrote it here, the suffering of holiness. That for us to understand that these intentional decisions, these, these hardships of the world that we place ourselves in, are also us participating in our set apartness that's given by God. And that we are to, to do these things and see these sacrifices and to see these, these sufferings um, as our way to purify ourselves, but also for us to understand how we are actively setting apart. We've talked about positive holiness and negative holiness a bunch. And what, what brings all of these kind of sufferings together in First Peter, the way he talks about it, is, is we, that our participation in any type of suffering is our participation in the way of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ suffered as far as the uh, the suffering of holiness. We look at the account of Jesus tempting him after the desert, and that's a, a picture-perfect reality of what that type of suffering looks like. And we also see the suffering and agony of the cross, which is the biggest example of physical suffering that we can ever really make manifest. But anytime we deal with suffering, we are dealing with suffering in the, in the way of Jesus Christ. We are showing that our reliance on God has the ability to push us through this. And so that is a grace of God. Wow, we realize that we are empowered by God, that the Spirit of God is within us, that the, the works of Christ are active and alive inside of us. And so that really, that's what Peter's trying to sum up this whole book right here, and that these are part of God's grace for you. It is the, the ability for you to get through this with the help of God is this measure of graciousness that's going on. You know, um, some people would like to read First Peter and think about this as like a heavy persecution book. And what, whereas he is talking about persecution at this layer, what we don't have the time to go into this morning really is, is what persecution actually looked like. It was a little bit different from what we would look, think it looks like. It's not nearly as widespread. And in many ways, um, it was not always just physical persecution. Um, but I think, I really do think this, because if we look at some of the writings of Paul and the way that he talked about the physical persecutions that he dealt with and other stuff, I think that if Peter is talking about like very extremely serious uh, 
like physical persecution that leads to death. I think his language would have been a little bit more stronger in certain areas here in the way that he was encouraging people. Um, and so, honestly, I think that the type of persecution he's speaking of are things that we can adapt into understanding in our lives now, uh, just just from reading the context of what Peter's saying. And the last thing that's just kind of neat um, is this. Peter says, your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings. And so, first of all, okay, Babylon, like, didn't know Peter was there. Well, Peter wasn't there. That Babylon, especially in the latter time of the first century, and especially think the book of Revelation, in many ways, Babylon, it means a couple of things, but really and truly what Peter is doing is he's appropriating Jewish language for exile. He's applying it into Christianity, but he's also appropriating Jewish imagery for Babylon as being the place that is furthest from Jerusalem that is further, for, furthest from the presence of God and from the holiness of God, that if we think about it in terms of you have completely sacred and completely secular, that we see whenever in Scripture we see these two cities mentioned, Jerusalem or Babylon, that the writer is, is, is really speaking of you have this place that's completely sacred, which the Jews would say because of the presence of God, the temple, all that kind of stuff. And then with Babylon, you've got this place that's completely secular. And so Peter say, just as he encouraged this the church several times throughout the letter to to see yourselves as travelers or sojourners or resident aliens. Um, there are all sorts of language across all translations that he uses for this. He's saying, hey, we're in the exact same place you are. In fact, we're in the worst of the worst. So that, that hold fast language. So just by him mentioning that, he brings in this entire wealth of metaphor we find all throughout the Old Testament of God's people persevering in the place where they don't belong. And what I love is that we, we, we pull into that, and, and I think of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. You know, a lot of us are familiar with Jeremiah 29, 11. Like, it's, cro it's cross-stitched on things. It's on pillows. You know, I, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a future. Like, we're, we know that verse. We forget where the context of that verse is, because that verse is smack in the middle of a chapter where God's telling his people, hey, listen, you really, really, really screwed things up. And I told you for years this would happen to you. And so for now, you have to spend 70 years in a place as, as it's not going to be good. But then he also says, but while you are there, there's a certain way you're supposed to behave. And Jeremiah 29, 7 says, pray for the peace and the prosperity of where I have placed you. And then he goes on to say, uh, uh, dig out vineyards, build orchards have children and marry them off and have grandchildren and marry them off. I was like, pray for the peace and the prosperity of where I have placed you. And so, so much this exile language is we begin to understand ourselves as Christians, as set apart and as foreigners in this land, but we also have this just deep, deep biblical understanding of, yeah, but you, while you were there, not only do you make it the best for yourself that you can, but you also are charged with making it better for everyone else. You need to pray for the shalom of this land. And so I love that Peter finishes off this just giant arc about us under, understanding ourselves as not belonging in the places where we live with this language that also hearkens us back to this understanding of we should be playing for the play, pray, praying for the places where we are because God has placed us there. So that's First Peter. That's it. A uh, couple follow-ups before we jump into the um, our time of prayer. First thing, I just put it back up on the screen. Make sure to leave your prayer requests in the comment bar. We're going to be coming to those in just a couple of minutes. Uh, good morning, Micah. Susan, what's up? It's so good to see you. Uh, hey, Lindsay, how are you doing? i got Susan Price on as well. And Janet, Colleen, Opal. It's so good to have all y'all this morning. It's great to see you. So we're about to go into prayer, but a couple, a couple of quick notes. We're going to do Jonah next, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, just kind of stoked for that. I'll be honest with you. I'm still deciding this or not. I might take next week off. Not sure yet, but I might, but I will let you know. Um, if I do that, I'll do that for a couple of reasons, but Hey Lisa, good morning to you. Um, might do that, but we're going to jump into Jonah next. So, uh, that should be a really fun book, but make sure to leave your prayer requests in the comment bar. We're about to go into our time of prayer. And as always, what we do is uh, we take this and we spend some time centering ourselves in the presence of God. 
We take time to thank him for the things he's done for us. We pray for the requests that we have before us, and then we offer ourselves to God. So that's kind of our pattern if you're new around here with how we handle this. So just a couple quick things. Make sure to drop those prayer requests in the comment bar. And also, if you would like to, just kind of just share this while we're praying, if you are this, or share this after we're done. It just helps us find more people for this community. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Let us just calm ourselves this morning. Uh, you know, take a few deep breaths wherever you are. Jesus, we uh, we come to you on this last day of the week, Lord, but in a time that's just been very shaken up. Um, I realized this morning that there's no such thing as Friday anymore. God, that uh, even the, the foundations that we thought would never change to understand just the rhythm of life that we have, Lord, that those are different. God, we pray that for whatever chaos is going on in our hearts right now, Lord, we uh, we pray for you to still it. God, and we pray for you to, uh, to give us the peacefulness of your Holy Spirit as we are here this morning. Lord, for us to, uh, to recognize and to see the things that are distracting us. God, for us to, to understand and identify those in our hearts right now, and for us just to, through your power, just move those things away from who we are so we can focus on you and you alone. So let us just take a few moments privately just to ask God to do these things. Jesus, thank you for being, uh, the scripture says, the, the firm anchor to our soul. Or we can attach ourselves to you. God, we thank you for how we've seen you working in our lives. How we've seen you uh, moving around us, God, to, for the things that you have been doing in our souls these last few weeks. One of my favorite phrase I've heard to describe this shelter in place season is that uh, there is the great pause. And it's time for many of us to just stop and reflect. And to, we make jokes about hitting a reset button. But Lord, you have given us the ability to hit a reset button, button for our souls. It's good for us to calmly move forward. God, we thank you for that. Lord, we also thank you and rejoice for the things that we have seen you do, God, the people we know who have been able to come through this virus. God, we rejoice with Belle uh, for Mark Whitney, um, Lord, just to see the amazing, beautiful things that are happening for him, God. And just being in my community, knowing the large amounts of people that were praying for him, God. And so I just ask that you give us eyes to see where you are at work. God, it helped us to transform our understanding of things, to recognize you better. God, and to give glory and honor to you when it's due. And it's due in many places that we don't typically see it, God. So let us just see times like this as, as moments that increase our faithfulness. God, we just we begin praying for each other and that the things that... Uh, that we have burdened upon our souls this morning. God, I think of, of all of my friends. I've, I've already, I've, I've just heard so much from about that they're 
that their health care has been just greatly impacted by this. God, I'm not sure if he's on the stream or not. He's been on here, one of our, our morning regulars, Lord, but we pray for Buddy more this morning. God, Buddy has cancer. And not only has his care been disrupted, um, he's in a space where he really needs the best medical attention that can be found, God, and that's being disrupted. Lord, and so we pray for Buddy this morning. We lift him up as, um, as he was having more just work done. God, he's a person who spent his entire life pouring himself out for, for other people. And Lord, uh, this morning, we just ask that you be with him and his family as he uh, just he needs you and that he needs healing. Lord, we know he's at the hospital. He's literally going in right now as we pray. Lord, so we pray the healing presence of Jesus Christ right now on him. God, we pray um, for, for you to completely come upon his physical presence. God, we also pray that you ease the anxiety and that you ease the, um, the questioning and the pain that he and his family are going through right now. Lord, thank you so much for that. God, we pray with... Uh, with Amy for Scott and for the Andrew Point family for this private funeral service that's going on. Or yeah, we, we prayed for him last week. Oh, God, just for his his stroke that he had, or for the people that right now are having to go through the movements of death. And or to not be able to grieve in the ways that they need to for not being able to uh, to be with family in these moments, God. Lord, we are learning to deal with grief and loss in a very, very different way. And that is one of these things that we're going to have to move through these next few months is understanding what grief and what, uh, God, as you said in Scripture, lament. Like We're going to have to learn what lament looks like. God, we pray for his family today at his funeral. Lord, we pray for our healthcare workers that are on the front lines of this, God, that are stepping in every single day. Uh, to take care of us, to uh, provide the care that so many desperately need. God, but we also pray for those who are working in healthcare that we don't think about that much. God, we, we pray for the janitors. We pray for the cleaning staff. We pray for the, for the support staff and the, the, the things that they are doing. God, to support this. God, we also pray for you to keep them safe. Lord, keep them healthy. This, 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 this season has exposed so many haves and have-nots. Lord, just break our hearts to understand the ways that we can engage ourselves for the betterment of our neighborhoods. As, as, as we talked about earlier, Lord, that, uh, to pray for the peace and the prosperity of where we are, Lord, we pray for that. We pray for you just to... To break our hearts, Lord, in ways that cause action. God, in ways that cause spiritual action, but also, Lord, in ways that cause physical action for us to, to share the things that we have, God, but for also desperately to be a people of prayer um, who realize that you are the one who fixes these things. Lord, and we look to you for that. We call out to you for that. God, so we offer ourselves to you today. We offer ourselves with everything that we have, with all we are, God. Lord, let us recognize the places in our lives that we are holding to ourselves, God. Let us yield those things over to you. Lord, let us understand that, that through our actions, God, of sacrifice, of suffering, of participation in your holiness, Lord, that we are creating new spaces for you in our life. Lord, as Miss Donna prayed this morning, break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. Jesus, we desire to be used by you and to be used by you uniquely in this current moment. But Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your power. Thank you for all of the things that you have given us, God, for letting us draw together this morning and uh, just taking time out to focus and begin ourselves with you. 
Jesus, thank you so much. And shall we pray? Amen. Well, thank you tons for being part of our stream uh, for the last few weeks. Um, but also just this morning, thank you for, for folks who've been on the whole time for kind of participating in that experiment. I'll see how that works out as the day kind of cruises along. So I uh, thank you so much for that. We're going to do Jonah next. And I'm, I'm still, I'm batting back and forth between if we're going to take, if I'm going to take a week off to kind of prep out and just get a little bit of rest in or if we're just going to jump headlong into it. I, I'll figure that out. I'll let you know on Facebook. But also, this is the last thing. So this Sunday at both Foundry and St. Andrews, the two churches I serve here in Sterlington, I'm sharing a message about what strong faith looks like. We're going to do it from Psalm chapter 26. And if, if, you, if you're local here, I would really, really love for you to be part of that. If you're not local, you know what the good thing about right now is you can see everything on Facebook. And so I'd invite you to, to worship with the church where you normally worship at, then maybe kind of come back along that afternoon to watch that message. It's something I think is really important because I asked this question, what does it mean for us to have a strong faith right now? And what does it mean for us to build up a strong faith during these times? And so thank you so much for being part of this. And um, I will see you later on.